Welcome to the state's first induced ice messy work group rollout of a primer addressing class two disposal wells and their potential association with seismic events. During today's webinar, we're going to introduce you to the induced seismicity work group. We're also going to have a primer overview. We're going to discuss the chapters that are the primary content of this primer. The work group was created through the State First initiative. State First is a collaboration or partnership between the Groundwater Protection Council and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. Through this collaborative effort, a national association of saltwater uh, protection officials, together with a multi-state government organization, primarily oil and gas regulatory people, have come together to address the issue of induced seismicity. The state's first group chartered the induced seismicity work group in 2014. This work group is led by state officials. The work group ad addresses uh, a means for the state officials to have a forum where they can discuss the issue of induced seismicity and learn from one another. We've also created a primer that allows us to summarize and share the knowledge that's gained through this work group. My name is Rick Simmers. I'm the Chief of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Division of Oil and Gas Resources Management. I'm one of the co-chairs of the work group. With me today is Rex Buchanan. Rex is the Interim Director of the Kansas Geological Survey. He is the State Geologist. He's the other co-chair. We also have Leslie Savage. Leslie's the Assistant Director for Technical Permitting for the Oil and Gas Division of the Texas Railroad Commission. And Ivan Wong, who's a principal seismologist with AECOM. The work group was comprised of at least 13 states that actively participated in the development of the primer. Those 13 states had 24 state employees that participated in the writing or review of this document. We also had support from many other groups. There were more than 60 volunteers, subject matter experts, from academia, research entities, federal agencies, industry, consulting firms, and NGOs. The collaboration of the state officials with all these other technical experts allowed us to create a, a primer to serve as a reference document for state regulatory programs. Through the development, we had broad stakeholder outreach, and we also developed an independent technical review panel, which conducted a peer review on the primer before its final form. The objectives of the work group were to share science, research, and technical understanding, as well as the experiences that state regulatory programs and state geologic surveys had with the issue of seismicity, and more specifically, in seismicity. The group created a forum where all those parties could have discussion and communication on this very important issue. We created a document that helps those people manage and mitigate the risks that might be associated with seismicity, particularly induced seismicity. This primer serves as a summary of the current knowledge and approaches that are being used to address the issue of induced seismicity. The primer development process uh, began more than a year ago. Um, a number of the states four or five years ago began having an increase in the number of seismic events that were occurring. In my home state of Ohio, about a month after I became chief, we had a 4.0 event, and at one point we determined that it was likely an induced event associated with an injection operation. As part of our response to this, we created a seismic section. We bought seismometers and deployed those. We worked with consultants and other experts regionally. And we had an executive order that gave us temporary authority to cause seismic conditions to be applied to sites to minimize the potential for this kind of activity. 
We also worked on legislative changes, um, but this didn't seem to be enough. We went to the executive director of IOGCC, Mike Smith, and the executive director of GWPC, Mike Pate, and asked if they could help create a forum for the state regulators to get together to discuss this very important issue. Both those leaders went to the state's first executive committee and uh, created a forum where the states could get together and have discussion. Early on, five states began that discussion. Those states were Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, and Ohio, but that quickly expanded to many more states. We developed a charter and we had stakeholder meetings with discussion and exchange of information. Uh, it became apparent that these discussions need to be captured in writing, so we formed groups to try to document uh, the content of the forums that we were holding. In February of this year, we created an outline and began to develop a primer to capture all the information that was being exchanged through this forum. In May of this year, we had the first draft of the primer. With that first draft, we created an editorial committee that took uh, content that was developed by many, many authors, as many as 80 to 90 authors, and tried to put it into a document that would flow and could be understood. It became readily apparent that we needed an independent technical review panel to look at the document as well. This panel served as a peer review panel, and we gave a, a draft of this document to that panel, and they did a very thorough review of our draft. One of the things they did was uh, suggest that we totally rearrange the document so it would flow and read much easier. They also gave us many, many comments of, tech, of a technical nature. Through the past month or two, we've been doing final edits on the document, and today we're releasing the primer in its final form. The primer overview is focused on class two disposal wells. Um, the document is an informational document meant to provide regulatory program managers with technical information and uh, program oversight type information so they can make decisions about their own program. The document is not uh, a proposed rule or regulation. We believe that uh, this document will serve as a good guidance tool, a good advisory tool, a good toolbox for state regulators to manage their own program at the state or local level. This document contains four primary chapters. It has a preface and an executive summary. The chapters include the first chapter, which helps us understand and do seismicity, a second chapter that talks about induced seismicity and how you differentiate it from natural seismicity. A third chapter talks about the risks and management and mitigation strategies that may be applied to those risks. And the final chapter talks about engagement. Seismic events, especially those felt seismic events, are something that people notice. So it's extremely important to communicate every aspect of the seismic event with all the parties that may be interested. The document also can, contains nine technical appendices. These technical appendices uh, account for the majority of this 160-page document. They're very important, and I encourage each participant in this webinar to get a copy of this document and read through the entire document. At this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Next speaker is Rex Buchanan. Rex is going to help us understand the issue of induced seismicity. Rex? Thanks, Rick. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you, Ben. Uh, really what I want to do with this chapter is an introduction to the topic of induced seismicity. And you can think of, you can define induced seismicity as really man-made or act, earthquake activity or uh, earthquakes that are caused by human activity of, of one sort or another. Now, just to be clear, occasionally you will hear both the terms induced seismicity or triggered seismicity used to uh, describe this phenomenon. Uh, throughout this report, and for the sake of what we're talking about on the webinar this morning, uh, we use the term induced seismicity to uh, refer to uh, 
earthquakes that are caused by uh, human activity. Uh, this first chapter basically is an introduction to this whole topic of induced seismicity. One of the themes that you'll hear throughout this webinar is the difficulty of differentiating induced seismicity, uh, man-made activity, uh, earthquake activity from natural seismicity. And this first chapter sort of tries to lay out some of the issues involved in that. And the focus here in terms of induced seismicity is primarily on wastewater disposal, on, on the fluids that are brought to the surface during the production, particularly of, of oil and gas. A lot of it is salt water, but it's a, uh, th that wastewater then has to be disposed of, and uh, the connections between that and induced seismicity are, are much of what this first chapter focuses on. We'll go to the next slide, which shows the increase in seismic activity that we've seen here in my part of the world in the mid-continent. Uh, this slide shows uh, both earthquakes uh, occurring from 1973 to 2008, and then differentiates those with red dots that show the more recent ones from uh, 2009 to 2015. And you can see numerically these are these are uh, earthquakes as recorded by the U.S. Geological Survey, and you can see that dramatic increase in numbers. It particularly shows up in 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 the part of the world that, that where I live in in Oklahoma and uh, to a certain extent in, in South Central Kansas. And to give you some idea of just how big that increase has been here in my part of the world, in a typical year we might have one or two earthquakes that were reported by the, the uh, national network operated by the U.S. Geological Survey. In uh, 2014, we had uh, 125 to 130 of those earthquakes. So far in 2015, we're at about 120. We've almost uh, surpassed the record that was set last year. So, uh, and, and you can you can uh, multiply those numbers even more in Oklahoma, where that increase has been even even more dramatic. So, there's no question that we've seen something very new and different happen here in the mid-continent uh, in terms of seismicity. We'll go to the next slide. This slide makes the point about the difference between induced seismicity and tectonic. The, the word tectonic, or the phrase tectonic seismicity, sometimes is basically just another way of talking about natural seismicity. So we're differentiating natural seismicity from from uh, seismicity that's caused by in in uh, by human activity. And people have known for a long time that humans can, in effect, uh, induce or cause earthquakes, and they can do that in a whole variety of ways. Uh, not just with the injection of fluids into the subsurface, but also through uh, the impoundment of reservoirs behind dams, and particularly in uh, the geothermal process where people uh, uh, crack open rocks related to getting out geothermal energy. Uh, again, in my part of the world, the, the, the place people began to, to uh, pay particular attention to this was in the Denver area in the 1960s with disposal of fluids in that area that set off uh, some earthquakes. So uh, again, they, they, they can be caused by a variety of sources, but for the sake of what we're talking about in the webinar today and for the most part in this report, what we're talking about are earthquakes that are probably related to the injection of wastewater back into the deep subsurface. Much of that is salt water. It's salt water that's been produced with the oil and gas during the oil and gas uh, production process. That salt water has to be disposed of in some fashion, and today it's typically injected back into uh, rock layers in the in the uh, deep subsurface. And one of the theories is that uh, where there are faults in that deep subsurface, and, and here now we're, we're referring to rock to what we call basement rocks, the crystalline igneous metamorphic rocks in the very deep subsurface, that faults in those may be critically stressed. And where the introduction of salt water into the rock units above that basement rock may change the, the pressure regime fluids in that deep subsurface, it may allow those uh, critically stressed faults to move. And so that's the theory behind, in effect, how human activity can induce earthquakes. We'll go to the next slide, which shows uh, a diagram of, of uh, faults of concern. It takes a real unusual set of circumstances to, uh, to, uh, to induce seismicity. Most of the earthquakes that you see around the world and in this country are natural earthquakes because it does take a very uh, different set of, of circumstances to trigger one of these earthquakes. And one of those is you not only have to have a fault present, obviously you need a fault in order to generate the earthquake, but that fault has to be one that's uh, 
near uh, about ready to rupture or about ready to produ uh, produce an earthquake anyway. And it has to be oriented in such a fashion that those pressures, that those poor pressure changes will allow it to uh, go ahead and move. We talk about those faults as faults of concern. And those are the, those ones that are oriented the, the way that, that might allow induced seismicity to take place and uh, are critically stressed. Those are the kinds of faults that, concern, that, we're, that, that we're concerned about. Now, just to be clear, there are faults throughout the subsurface. We know where some of them are, but there are probably a lot more out there that we don't know anything about. So one of the challenges in dealing with this issue is just the fact that we don't have all those faults mapped, and we don't know where all of them are. Uh, so this issue of, uh, of identifying those faults, figuring out which ones are really faults of concern, is, uh, is uh, an important component of this work. Uh, we also have Ivan Wong on, on this uh, uh, webinar. He's a, a seismologist. Ivan, anything to add on that faults of concern slide? No, Rex, I think you covered that well. Thank you. Okay. The next slide we'll go to is one that talks about magnitude. And there are various ways of measuring or, or talk, comparing earthquakes. And, and there are a whole variety of scales available for doing that. And one of the, the uh, complexities here and one of the areas where confusion can kind of creep in is when people are using different scales to talk about these earthquakes. Now, one of the scales that you will sometimes hear people talk about is the modified Mercalli scale, and it's a really a measure of the intensity of the shaking of the Earth's surface. And it's a good way to compare various earthquakes. It's, uh, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't rely on instrumentation. It relies more on uh, people's report of how these earthquakes feel at the surface. And the reason it's so important is it allows us to compare historic earthquakes, earthquakes that occurred back in the days before uh, there were instruments available to uh, measure them and to put numbers on them so we can compare those earthquakes with the earthquakes that we feel today. So modified Mercalli is, is a way of using those reports. It's also used not just historically, but the U.S. Geological Survey allows people to uh, send in felt reports on their network when there's an earthquake alert, and they send those reports in in terms of how the earthquake felt. Did it cause damage? Was it, was it strong enough to, to scare people, or was it just barely felt? Those are expressed in Roman numerals, so if you see a, a magnitude expressed in a, in a Roman numeral, it's one of those modified Mercalli uh, uh, rankings of earthquakes. Uh, people also use moment magnitude as a as a, another way to uh, to show the size of an earthquake, and I'll turn it over to Ivan to talk about moment magnitude. Thanks, Rex. One of the one of the things about the primer is that uh, we were very careful with the way we uh, give the size of an earthquake. So in the primer, we have been consistent in using moment magnitude. So you might ask, why is that and why is that important? Well, moment magnitude is the preferred magnitude scale used by seismologists because it's directly related to the size of the event. Uh, in particular, how big the fault is that ruptures in an earthquake and how much the fault moves. You, many of you are familiar with the, the first magnitude scale, which is the Richter local magnitude scale. Uh, and as Rex said, there are a number of scales out there. Um, and often there's confusion because an earthquake may be assigned various values because the scales uh, differ. So in the primer, we have stuck with moment magnitude because it's the best scale. Over to you, Rex. Okay, thanks, Ivan. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide. And it's, regardless of what the numerical assignment is about the earthquake, really what people are concerned about is the hazards associated with, with these earthquakes uh, that, that's related to the shaking of the ground, which basically is the source of the damage. Now, for the most part, uh, people talk about damage really occurring when you have uh, earthquakes that are of magnitude 5 or greater. For the most part, in very general terms, uh, with the induced seismicity that we've seen here in the, in the mid-continent, most of these earthquakes have been smaller than five. There are very few that are larger than five. Uh, so the few, a few cases there, have been, there has been damage associated with them, but for the most part, not. Now, in some cases, it is possible to have damage associated non-structural damage, like, say, uh, 
a crack in a wall or some, or a, a dish falling off the wall or something like that, and you have that kind of, of uh, damage uh, in, in smaller magnitude earthquakes, even ones as small as a 3.0 and larger. Again, that, that kind of damage is rare, but it, but it certainly does occur. And for the most part, as I said, those events, the induced events, we've had some here in Kansas, for example, we've had several in the four to five magnitude range, but nothing larger than five, and larger than five has really been, been rare in, in this process. Uh, next slide. This is a point that I want to make quickly, but it is an important one. This topic talks, a, uh, this primer talks a little bit about uh, seismicity related to hydraulic fracturing, but it doesn't talk about it very much because the reports of felt seismicity, that is earthquakes strong enough to feel at the surface, the reports of those caused by directly by the hydraulic fracturing process itself are very, very small, just a handful. And, and here in Kansas, we don't have any earthquakes that we can connect directly to hydraulic fracturing. Uh, the, the focus here in terms of what we're looking at in our part of the world on induced seismicity is with wastewater disposal and, and not hydraulic fracturing. The primer talks about hydraulic fracturing a little bit, but, but uh, only addresses it uh, 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 in a small degree because the primary focus, again, is on wastewater disposal. And finally, one of the things that I think for my world, in the research world, that's really important is that the research needs out, are, out here are great, and uh, what we learn about these things is changing almost every day. What we know today is, I think, much greater than what we knew a year ago at this time, but there are still an awful lot of challenges in terms of understanding this. This is a subsurface feature. We can't see what's going on down there. So being able to understand this is, uh, is a challenge. One of the big challenges I mentioned before is fault mapping. We don't know where a lot of these faults are. We don't know if, uh, that because a lot of these earthquakes are somewhat shallow, as Ivan will talk about, we don't really know uh, how that changes the, the effect that they can have. We don't know necessarily what the largest maximum magnitude of an induced event could be. We, we, we have a a pretty idea, good idea of sort of what the relationship of small versus large earthquakes is in the natural world, but does that same relationship hold true in the induced world? Those are the kinds of things we don't know. So the research needs here are great. People are working on it, but this is a, a still process, a work in progress, I guess would be the best way to put it, and one that will uh, require ongoing research. With that, I'll uh, turn it over to next speaker, Ivan Wong. Thanks, Mike. So our chapter two deals with how do we assess uh, induced seismicity. Uh, if you're a state regulator and an earthquake occurs or a series of earthquakes, how can you tell whether those earthquakes are induced or whether they're natural? Now, you might think that's a very simple thing to do, but it's not. Uh, natural earthquakes occur. Almost all the states uh, in the United States have natural earthquakes. They have them at different rates, but still, uh, natural earthquakes occur. And so just because an earthquake occurs, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's induced or it's associated with some type of injection. Maybe an equally uh, more imp equally important question for state regulators is if someone is requesting a permit to put an injection well uh, in an area where there have been no earthquakes, how can we assess the potential for induced seismicity to occur when that injection operation uh, goes into uh, effect? Next slide, please. So chapter two focuses on, no, uh, back please. Uh, chapter two focuses on these uh, primary uh, areas, evaluating the general patterns of seismicity, in particular distinguishing them uh, from natural seismicity and that's usually uh, derived from looking at the historical record. Detecting and locating earthquakes, very important. Where are the earthquakes occurring uh, with respect to uh, a map view and, and depth with respect to any potential injection operations? So that requires seismic monitoring. Uh, state regulators uh, don't always have access uh, to good seismic monitoring operations. And so one of the things that's happening in the state is uh, oil and gas uh, regulatory agencies are looking at developing and improving the statewide coverage of earthquakes. 
uh, evaluating the causes of specific seismic events. Again, it's often difficult to distinguish a natural earthquake from an induced earthquake. It's difficult to uh, associate uh, induced earthquakes, maybe, with a specific well or wells, because often in areas where there's injection wells, there's multiple wells. Uh, and often even in cases where we think the earthquakes are induced, there's no universal agreement that they are. So we talk about the methods used in trying to uh, evaluate the causes of uh, induced events, uh, as well as some very sophisticated seismological techniques that are being used. Next slide. OK, there's, as Rex mentioned, there's three very critical components or factors uh, that will lead to induced seismicity. You need to have sufficient pore pressure buildup from uh, the disposal activities. And based on our uh, evaluations of past cases of induced seismicity, it doesn't take much pore pressure to induce an earthquake. We need the faults of concern, which Rex talked about. And we need a pathway for those increased pore pressures to travel from the injection point down to where the earthquakes are occurring. And the largest earthquakes, as Rex mentioned, are, are earthquakes that are occurring in critically stressed faults that are in basement rock. In terms of what the states need to consider, they again, they need to look at the general patterns of seismicity uh, in, uh, based on the historical record. Uh, and they uh, need that so they can distinguish areas that may be areas of concern. Uh, once, once that happens, uh, investigations need to uh, be carried out to find out what are the causes of specific events. Uh, and often that will require uh, detailed seismological uh, and subsurface characterization and even modeling efforts. Next slide. So there are some key things that go into evaluating seismicity. Uh, when a uh, earthquake or earthquake sequence occurs, obviously if it uh, represents a significant increase over the background seismicity or the earthquakes are larger than those, those um, observed in the past, then that would lead one to uh, uh, doing further investigations. Uh, again, the, uh, the occurrence of earthquakes in areas that have uh, historically have not experienced seismic activity, those are probably the areas that are easier to pinpoint uh, that earthquakes may be induced. But uh, in many areas of the uh, central US, uh, there is a level of historical seismicity. Now, how does one get the data uh, to assess the level and past history of historical seismicity? There are historical records. And what we mean by historical records is uh, earthquakes that have been recorded by seismic stations. Uh, seismic stations were uh, first developed in California in the early part of the century. But we really didn't have a good national network until about the 1960s. But uh, in the last several decades, we have uh, sources of historical seismicity based on instrumental records. We can get those from the National Earthquake Information Center uh, at the USGS uh, in uh, Golden, Colorado. Uh, many state agencies have good sources of historical data. Universities have that data. And of course, uh, there are both statewide networks, regional networks, as well as local op uh, networks operated by either government agencies or oil and gas uh, companies where we can get data. As Rex mentioned, before we had uh, uh, seismographic instruments, we had to rely on uh, reported earthquakes. Uh, those that were felt, you can go to academic reports. Uh, newspapers are a wonderful source of pre-instrumental records. Uh, and there's summaries, historical summaries, that have been uh, put together by uh, academic uh, uh, folks. Next slide. A, a, a key part of mitigation for induced seismicity is seismic monitoring. Um, the overriding goal of the perimeter uh, is, of course, we are concerned with public safety. Public safety is 
first and foremost, uh, the goal of the perimeter, and that's what uh, the, the goal is of state regulators. So seismic monitoring is an integral part of any mitigation measure to, uh, to make sure that the public is safe from induced seismicity. So seismic monitoring allows us to manage and mitigate risk by, what, by observing earthquakes that may have occurred uh, in an area of concern. Uh, seismic monitoring provides the necessary information for both public and stakeholder response, as well as it's a great tool for education. There are basically two types of uh, seismic networks. Those are the permanent ones. Uh, those are ones that are uh, been installed and are expected to, uh, to operate for very, very long periods of time, such as the USGS National Network is a permanent network. Some of the university and regional networks are permanent. A temporary network is where someone comes in and puts in a network of instruments just for a, a short period of time, maybe to observe a sequence of earthquakes or to cover an area where no earthquakes have occurred, but to try to get um, a background uh, level of, uh, of seismicity. Next slide. One of the things that's important in terms of seismic monitoring is being able to locate these earthquakes uh, very accurately with respect to both uh, 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 map view or horizontally, but also with respect to depth. What we want to be able to do is, if we see a sequence of earthquakes, is we want to know at what depth are the earthquakes occurring, what is their relationship to potential or ongoing injection activities. Are the earthquakes occurring uh, near the uh, injection point? Are they occurring in the deeper basement rock? Um, and what is the timing of these events? Are they occurring soon after injection operation uh, starts up? Are they occurring weeks to months to years after injection activities are already commenced? The national network operated by the USGS gives us a good uh, picture of where earthquakes are occurring but because the stations are widely spaced, particularly in the central and eastern U.S., uh, the, the epicentral uncertainty or the location on the maps on the uh, Earth's surface can be off by 5 or 10 kilometers. That's critical to try to reduce that uncertainty. Depth-wise, because you basically have to have a seismic station over the seismic activity, the uncertainty can be as much as 10 kilometers. That's very important because induced earthquakes are generally occurring in the very shallow part of the Earth's crust in the top few kilometers. And if you can't assess a depth of an earthquake to 10 kilometers, it's not going to be very helpful. So in an effort to try to improve the resolution or accuracy of locating earthquakes, states are, uh, are installing seismic stations or they're augmenting their existing seismic uh, uh, monitoring capabilities with the intent of trying to improve the accuracy of, the, of locating earthquakes. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of, of evaluating the causes of induced earthquakes, again, I want to stress that it's, it's often very difficult to differentiate between natural earthquakes and tectonic earthquakes. Uh, to give you an example, we've seen <clears throat> unusual seismic activity in south central Colorado in the Raton Basin. It's, it's very debatable right now uh, on whether those earthquakes are natural or, or induced because they are occurring relatively deep and there has been natural seismicity in the past. So again, there, it, it's a difficult challenge and it's a challenge that uh, we, need to, uh, we need to try to uh, address. There are different techniques <clears throat> that one can consider in, in investigating the cause of earthquakes. Most of these techniques come from basic uh, seismology because, again, induced earthquakes are just like natural earthquakes, but they have been triggered because of some uh, man-made activities such as injection. So uh, we talked about accurately locating events, so we could associate those with the injection activities. We need to be able to locate those critically stretched faults uh, that 
uh, that may have been reactivated or can be reactivated. Uh, we need to identify the temporal and spatial uh, evolution of seismic events. And what I mean by here, we need to establish the timing of earthquakes uh, relative to injection activities. And we need to establish what is the spatial relationship between these earthquakes and where the injection is occurring. Um, we need to be able to identify the causative fault. Uh, if the fault is in the basement, uh, are the injection activities which are causing pore pressure increases, are they triggering these earthquakes um, on a basement fault? Uh, we need to understand uh, the stresses in the earth near the fault. Uh, why are the faults critically stresses? Uh, are they favorably oriented? And uh, in terms of uh, more sophisticated techniques, we may have to develop, uh, mo uh, we have modeling techniques, but we may need to be able to characterize the physical properties of, of the reservoir, the rock that's near the injection. Um, what are the geomechanical aspects of the reservoir? Uh, what, in, what in particular is inducing causing these earthquakes to occur, what are the pathways in which pore pressures uh, can change? So uh, I'd like to turn it over, uh, Chapter 3, to Leslie. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I'm Leslie Savage with Texas. Chapter 3 of the Premer focuses on risk, hazard of induced, risk and hazard of induced seismicity, management of, of risk associated with induced seismicity, and provide strategies or some strategies for mitigation and response to that seismicity. Um, states, as Rex noted earlier, there are some commonalities regarding the risk of injection-induced seismicity. Um, for example, injection close to or into the basement rock, uh, the crystalline basement. Um, however, there is enough variability that states are best positioned to respond to potentially injection-induced seismicity because of their knowledge of operations in their state and of the local, local geology. Because there is significant variability in local geology and surface conditions, the states are better able to consider local and regional needs and conditions, such as population, building, infrastructure, critical facilities, and monitoring capabilities when determining how to manage and mitigate risks associated with induced seismicity. A one size fits all regulatory approach is not appropriate to this issue. States have developed diverse strategies for avoiding, mitigating, and responding to risks of induced seismicity in siting, permitting, and monitoring of disposal wells. In most states, the jurisdiction for managing the risks associated with potential, in potential injection induced seismicity related to oil and gas activities rests with a state oil and gas division, a board, or a commission. This document is designed to support states in determining the regulatory mechanisms that might be appropriate to consider in any given situation. The document provides these state regulators with a clear discussion of many of the available tools and protocols to develop strategies for managing and mitigating risks that associated with injection-induced seismicity. In developing risk management protocols, it's important to understand the difference between hazard and risk. Hazard is defined as any source of potential damage, harm, or adverse impact on something or someone. Risk is the change or the chance and or probability that a person or property will be harmed if exposed to the hazard. Risk assessment generally addresses two distinct questions. How likely is an injection operation to pose a hazard for induced seismicity? And what is the risk of harm to people or property? Risk includes an assessment of hazard and the probability that that, that, that hazard will be realized. Data are required to understand both the hazard and the risk. For those situations where risk is elevated, depending on local conditions, it may be appropriate to consider specific risk mitigation op options. That's what this chapter in the Primer uh, discusses. The actual level of potential risk associated with local conditions is generally considered during the development of any mitigation measures 
if those measures are determined to be prudent. <clears throat> Excuse me. States have developed regulatory response strategies to address seismicity that's been determined to be induced by injection. These strategies enable these agencies to implement flexible and adaptive me measures that consider the characteristics of the location at which injection is occurring. You may have heard of the traffic light approach. That's one of these strategies. In general terms, such response strategies enable consistent responses to potential inject injection-induced seismicity. If there's an earthquake of concern, certain actions are taken to mitigate the risks of increased seismicity, either in number or magnitude, and or magnitude. Response strategies may include thresholds that lead to specific paths in your decision-making process to determine which actions to manage the risks associated with induced seismicity are appropriate. The decision process is used to interpret seismic data and determine the best action for managing the risk associated uh, with this particular situation. This decision process generally includes interaction with the operator or operators of injection wells that are in the area of the seismic activity and collaboration with those operators during the development of site-specific actions to manage the risk. In addition to responding to potentially in, a potential injection-induced seismic events, states also are reviewing uh, applications for disposal wells uh, to mitigate the risks of seismic activity. As Ivan discussed earlier, there are certain conditions in which seismic risk may be increased. In such areas, risk mit mitigation options and siting and permitting of new Class II disposal wells can include things like avoiding injection into the crystalline basement, as we've mentioned before, avoiding direct injection into known faults of concern, locating faults in the vicinity of the proposed, proposed project area, and, and placing a well outside of the, this area of concern. Uh, you can also uh, limit volumes of uh, fluid injected, which will impact the, uh, the, pre the pore pressure. In these instances, states also may include special permit conditions if they determine that there is uh, an increased risk of seismic activity. These permits can, can include requirements for temporary seismic monitoring, for uh, monitoring of operations if ground motion events occur. Um, they can include conditions that, that uh, suspend the operations if seismicity levels increase above a certain threshold, and they can include a metric to determine if, when the operations could be restarted. Uh, these conditions um, are determined on a site-specific assessment of the area in which that disposal well would be located. For example, in Texas, Railroad Commission adopted r rules that incorporate these concepts and allow the Commission to determine which actions are appropriate on a site-specific basis. Okay, now I'm going to turn it back over to Rex Buchanan, and Rex is going to provide an overview of Chapter 4 relating to the considerations for external communication and engagement. Thank you, Rex. Thanks, Leslie. We'll move through this final chapter pretty quickly. Go on to the next slide. Uh, I think you'll get some sense, if you haven't already, that there are an awful lot of players involved in this process. So when we do have, when an earthquake takes place, uh, coordinating the communication related uh, is really important because there are so many people, there are so many sources of information. The agencies and, and the folks involved uh, in all of this, the primary point of this chapter is simply the planning is really important. You can't anticipate these events, so you need to be prepared. You need to, to decide who will speak to what kinds of questions so you can coordinate responses effectively in effect, in effect on the fly. Next slide. One of the points of this, I think, is that uh, in, in, in my part of the world, these, uh, the, these earthquakes are particularly disconcerting because we're not used to this level of seismicity. One of the folks that I've worked with down in South Central Kansas early on as we began to see earthquakes said to me, uh, 
you know, we're used to tornadoes. We, uh, we get some warning with tornadoes, and we know what to do when we have one. With earthquakes, we don't get any warning, and we don't have any idea what to do. So obviously, the folks in the public are very concerned, and when you have those events, you need to be able to provide as much information as you can. Now, one of the points of this chapter is there are, are an awful lot of, uh, one of the points throughout this uh, primer is there, there are an awful lot of unknowns. But it is important to be able to answer the questions as best you can and to coordinate who can, who can answer those questions, particularly related to monitoring and what we know about the earthquakes, so the public can find out as much information as, as we have available. Next slide. So providing all that information is, uh, is really important, and, and I would say engaging st stakeholders and, and getting back to them on a regular basis, as this uh, slide points out, is, is really important. You can't let a whole lot, you need regular communication is just really critical here. Uh, even if you haven't had an earthquake for a few, few months or, or over a certain amount of time, continuing that dialogue so people know that the, the agencies are studying this process, this issue, what steps they're taking, that continual back and forth communication is really important and I think this chapter makes that point. And then with the final slide, just to conclude that again, this is a complex issue and because it is so complex, the, uh, the cast of characters involved in studying it, responding in, in, with, uh, to it is, is uh, very great. And so coordinating the kind of communication that comes out of all those players is really important. So that's what this chapter covers. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Rick, and I think Rick will walk through the acknowledgments of everybody involved, and you'll begin to get a sense of just uh, what a big cast of uh, players this really is. So Rick, back to you. Okay, thanks, Rex. Um, as we conclude this web uh, webinar, we do want to highlight and, and let you know that induced seismicity is a very complex issue. We think this primer uh, can assist state regulators in that decision-making process, and we hope it'll be used that way. With that, we'd like to go through a few acknowledgements. The uh, IOGC and GWPC provided staff that helped us with this document, and it's an understatement to say that had they not helped us, this document would not have been completed. So we owe a uh, sincere thank you to them for all their efforts. There's an induced seismicity work group editorial committee. Um, the members are listed. That work group met on several occasions in Oklahoma and, and weekly for phone calls to try to take uh, documents that were prepared by 80 plus authors and coalesce those into a document that would float. So, uh, you know, many thanks to those editorial committee members. Maybe one of the more important groups that was involved with this is an independent technical review panel. Now we talked about this group briefly in the opening and throughout the document. Um, you can see the people that were involved in this. There are no industry representatives on this panel, nor are there any state regulators on this panel. We did that for a purpose. This panel went in and critically reviewed this document, suggested a drastic reorganization, which we accepted, and then provided many, many technical comments, which we included in the final draft. We think this is a, an exceptionally good document uh, to a large degree based on this technical review panel's comments. So we thank them. The, the next group are the technical advisors, and there are pages of these people. These are the contributing uh, authors or reviewers. Obviously, we're not going to go through all these, but I would like you to take a moment and look at all the people that were involved in this and the diverse backgrounds and uh, organizations that these people work for. Um, many of these people contributed some of the language to the document. Many of them helped review the document. And I'd also like to thank the state directors for the oil and gas program. In one of our last versions, last draft versions of this document, we got most of the state directors, state oil and gas directors from around the country on a call, and we worked them through this document to see if this would help them if they ever needed it. And they provided very meaningful feedback to us. So with that, we'll conclude this webinar. And the one thing we would like to point out, that if you're interested in viewing this webinar or frequently asked questions, 
that may be associated with it or the document itself. You can find those at the website that's listed. Thank you for your participation.